Dr. Samsudin, if you just mind, uh, don't mind just scrolling through your slides just to see if they're moving on live, please. Perfect. Thank you. So good evening everyone, I'm Divya, I'm one of the Ops and Kindly Leads at um, with MindAbleep.com. Uh, 
We've got Dr. Samsudin Kadaru here today with us uh, from Mauritius. He's currently a Northwest trainee, Ops and Kearney trainee, um, and he's currently an SD2 in Wigan Infirmary. Um, he'll be talking to us today about um, abdominal pain in pregnancy and non-pregnancy related patients. Um, and without further ado, um, Dr. Samsudin, you can take the lead. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Samsudin. I'm one of the ST2 trainees in Opsenga. So I've got only a few weeks left, three weeks, basically, to start working as a registrar in Opsenga and in Wigan Infirmary. So the topic of my presentation today would be mostly about abdominal pain, but more importantly, focused for pregnant, for pregnant ladies as well altogether, because sometimes it can be quite difficult to diagnose different etiological um, causes for the pain when someone is pregnant at that time. Um, sorry, my slides are mostly informative in nature, but I'll try to go through them as much as I can. And please feel free to ask any questions at any time uh, on the chat, and I'll try to answer them as much as I, as quickly as I possibly can. So basically, the main differentials for someone presenting to the emergency emergency department with abdominal pain when they are pregnant, um, those are the list of differentials. So basically, when someone comes being pregnant, um, presenting to a and &E, um, the first thing that a and &E would do is, well, freak out initially, initially, and then they will try to contact the obstetrics or gynecology team as soon as possible to try to um, make that patient go to the obstetrics and gynecology side to be assessed properly rather than starting all the initial assessment and investigation and possible management plan on a &E. So the main differentials for someone com coming to a &E being pregnant with uh, abdo pain are like normal uh, differentials really. So they can be constipated and um, they can be having an acute appendicitis well, one in 5,000 pregnancies will be presenting to ED with right iliac fossa pain, and it turns out to be um, acute appendicitis. Um, a and &E would always try to make it sound like it's an ectopic pregnancy happening at that time if they are quite early in pregnancy. We should always be careful about ruling out uh, acute appendicitis because it has severe consequences depending on the gestation uh, as, uh, throughout pregnancy. It can also be acute cholecystitis um, or cholelithiasis, basically, at that time. It can be acute pyelonephritis, starting first with a UTI, then progressing to acute pyelonephritis um, around 25 in, in a 1,000 pregnancies will present with pyelonephritis at that time. Um, another reason will be um, pelvic inflammatory disease, which is getting more and more common now um particularly where i'm working in the northwest um of england over the last few years really um can also be an agnet an agnexal torsion um is ovarian cystotion happening as well um usually when it's quite early in pregnancy and they're having some abdominal cramps and possibly some bleeding or spotting we tend to try to rule out one will be um, a miscarriage happening and the second will be what we really need to rule out is an ectopic pregnancy because depending on that stage of the ectopic pregnancy uh, it can be quite life-threatening for the woman uh, as well and now when it's quite late in pregnancy we need to rule out preterm labor and also placental abruption as well as uterine rupture to be honest, for those late pregnancy complications, they usually tend to ring triage and present to tr maternity triage um, straight away rather than going through a and &E. so, <clears throat> so the first one, as I was mentioning, is constipation, which affects around 40% uh, around of pregnancies at a time. If we allow constipation to carry on for a good sometimes can can last for five days up to seven days it can have big consequences leading leading to, well the, it can cause fecal impaction uh, it can make the person going to re urinary retention having some rectal bleeding um because of the bulk of the feces being there um and it can also lead to overflow diarrhea as well altogether um, and these symptoms can be worsened 
um, if they have uh, an associated hemorrhoids with it as well altogether. So the usual management for these pregnant ladies with presenting with constipation is after good examination, abdominal examination, and sometimes uh, a PR exam as well, depending on the severity of the constipation is conservative management with them going home to increase their fluid intake and dietary intake. Otherwise, you can also help them with different kind of bulk forming uh, agents or osmotic laxatives, as well as stimulant laxatives as well altogether, uh, that being lactulose or movicol, and uh, sometimes senna as well altogether. Now, um, if they've got proper fecal impaction after doing a PR exam and you've diagnosed fecal impaction, you can always help them with a four gram suppository of um, glycerol suppository at that time. Um, and if you're more and more concerned that they might have uh, possible bowel obstructions, which is quite rare, um, they need to be assessed by the general surgical team at that point in view of having uh, an abdominal x-ray, but more so of a CT scan to be able to rule out the um, small or large bowel obstruction. Um, another most common cause of abdominal pain in pregnant ladies is uh, obviously a UTI. So, so many times when pregnant ladies come to um, either A&E or triage, uh, what we, the first sign of investigation would be their blood pressure and their urine check also. So a lot of them, of these women will have a urine um, dipstick, which is positive for either leukocyte or nitrates altogether, but they can be asymptomatic at that time. So the general ruling is if someone is presenting, if a pregnant lady is presenting with asymptomatic bacteria, which is basically uh, a positive urine dipstick for, for them at that time, you should always have a low threshold to treat these women um, because it can easily progress to a proper UTI, i.e. cystitis, which will develop in about 30% of women uh, at that time. And these cystitis can further on progress to pyelonephritis. Any UTI happening in pregnancy uh, at that time increases the chance of that woman going into preterm labor further down the road. And if, you've not, if you're not catching it early at that stage, so this puts at even higher risk of entering preterm labor. Um, the main symptoms of the UTI would be as any UTIs anyway, it would be um, dysuria, increase in frequency, and some low abdo pain, generally suprapubic in nature. Now, with regards to antibiotics being given to pregnant ladies having a UTI, um, there are three main antibiotics that we usually use in the Northwest, uh, which are nitrofurantoin, cephalexin, and also trimethoprim. But that changes depending on the gestation age at that point. Um, so as you can see on the next slide, um, the first line in the Northwest here would be nitrofurantoin, um, 100 milligrams oral BD. But again, you shouldn't use it in the third trimester because it increases the risk of having of the baby developing hemolytic anemia. Not much research has been going into it, but the latest research has shown that there's an increased incidence of hemolytic anemia occurring if you start with nitrofurantoin in the third trimester. Um, the second line is usually trimethoprim oral, again, 200 milligrams BD. Uh, but this one you shouldn't be using in the first trimester because in the first trimester, um, up to 12 um, to 14 weeks, generally speaking, there's organogenesis happening for the baby. So as you probably know, trimethoprim is an antifolate uh, in nature. So it would it wouldn't be uh, a good choice of antibiotics in the first trimester at that point when all the organs are developing. Um, you don't want any neural tube defect to happen, even though the chances of it happening is quite low. But you don't want to put that woman at risk of, uh, of, of her baby at risk of developing neural tube uh, problems. Now, if you're sometimes if you're in a rush. Uh, and you're a bit unsure about the gestation age of the woman, um, the safe option would be cephalexin oral, 500 milligrams, three times a day. This you can use at any stage, uh, at any gestation age, really, um, with low side effects as well. Also, given that 
that woman is not allergic to penicillin or cephalexin, cephalosporins, basically. Um, on this slide, as you can see, I've clearly mentioned, so for usually for the UTIs in non-pregnant ladies, you would usually give them for a course of um, three days. Persistent UTI, you would maybe prolong it to seven days if you've not changed uh, to a different antibiotics. But in pregnant women, you should give them at least seven days of any of these um, oral antibiotics that I've just mentioned from before. Um, also, if someone is presenting with recurrent urinary tract infection, um, regardless whether she's pregnant and now more so that, regardless of whether she's non-pregnant and now more so that she's pregnant, you should have a low threshold, generally speaking, to um, book an outpatient ultrasound um, KUB at that time to make sure that she's not developing any um, renal abscess or any um, uh yeah, any renal abscess or any renal tract um, anomalies at that point. So, as I was mentioning, if you don't catch the, the cystitis early, it might progress into pyelonephritis. And as we all know, women are more prone to developing pyelonephritis when they are uh, pregnant and also generally sp speaking as well because of their short um, urethra. So, Pyelonephritis can complicate about 2% of pregnancies and they are most common in the second and third trimesters. Um, the symptoms are same for non-pregnant as well as pregnant ladies with them having costovertebral angle tenderness moving to the loins and then to the groins. They will have um, fever, rigors, um, sometimes swinging fever if they're at risk of developing a renal ab abscess as well altogether. That's why they should open discharge after having pyelonephritis as well, have a follow up with an ultrasound KUB to make sure again that this hasn't happened. Um, or any scarring as well of the renal tract has not happened. Um, and now the pyelonephritis can develop into full sepsis and septic shock, then you need to start treatment with um, IV antibiotics. So regardless of whether it's turn into sepsis or initial phases of pyelonephritis should have a low threshold to start them with on IV antibiotics, really. Um, but if they do develop se sepsis afterwards, you should go down the sepsis 6 pathway, as you would normally do for anyone um, having se sepsis. So as I just mentioned, in terms of investigation, it should be obviously um, taking the bloods uh, of these women, usually on a daily basis, or if any deterioration or non-improvement after 24 hours of IV antibiotics, then possible 12-hourly um, bloods at that point. Taking urine culture, blood cultures as well, in order to target the antibiotics to the right one. Um, hydration should be very important for those developing pyelonephritis as well. Um, Yep. So in terms of the treatment for pyelonephritis, once you start them on IV antibiotics, you should make sure that they have at least a good 24 hours, if not 48 hours of IV antibiotics. And then based on the blood, step them down to oral antibiotics. Um, if, they are, if their observations are getting better, bloods are getting better. And generally speaking, they are feeling better in themselves at that point. Um, but also on discharge, you should have should be thinking more um, of leaving them on to finish a course of oral antibiotics for about at least a good 10 days. Um, usually a lot of urologists would m discharge them on a course of 14 days of uh, oral antibiotics if they have been admitted and had sepsis with pyel pyelonephritis at that point. Um, so the next slide is another main cause of abdominal pain in pregnancy is appendicitis really it's the most common um, cause of acute abdomen in pregnancy uh, occurring in occurring in one in a thousand uh, pregnancies a lot most of them actually occur in the second trimester uh, as i mentioned here it can present a in, a in an atypical nature in pregnancy because of the distorted anatomy of the caused by the gravid uterus um at that point so 
based on previous research, um, the, it has shown that it usually, append the appendicitis, if it develops in, as from the second trimester onwards, it can present with right upper quadrant pain rather than right lower quadrant pain, which it would typically present uh, at that point because the appendicitis, can, the appendix can move as high up um, as the right hypochondria uh, region, hypochondrium at that point. But, tech, but but usually speaking, they would present with right iliac fossa pain. So the sign and symptoms are central uh, abdominal pain, then migrating to the right iliac fossa um, due to referred pain at that point, starting from the central abdomen. Um, they would be systemically unwell with, um, a lot of the time they would be systemically unwell uh, with nausea, vomiting, uh, fever, having deranged inflammatory markers, uh, we've raised white cell count and raised CRP. And yeah, the, those are the main symptoms that they usually present with if they are coming in with appendicitis. That's why. So um, as I was mentioning, so these th first three slides are, have, have been talking mostly about uh, UTIs, constipation and appendicitis. That's why it's very important uh, for me, when I get a call from A and E to ask about these three main presentation, really, I always ask them if they've done a urine dipstick to try to rule out um, if the woman is actually having a UTI. Um, firstly, secondly, I always ask about um, the bowels with regards to try to rule out uh, constipation, and third, if they if they um, they phone me from A and E, um, telling me about the woman complaining of right lower quadrant pain i always ask um, them to be seen by the general surgeons first so that they can lay a hand on on that woman's tummy and to rule out uh, appendicitis straight away because so many times they have been getting referrals from a and e with right lower quadrant pain and um, they are around five to six weeks pregnant i've accepted them they've come to gynae assessment unit and it turned out to be an acute appendicitis that they're having so it's a waste of time really I know a &E can be uh, quite busy and are trying to do their best by basically triaging those patients and to make sure that they are seen by the right specialty. But they need to, first of all, do the basic investigations. And as per our, I mean, as per Wigan's um, hospital policy, any one of the acute abdomen with right iliacus open should be seen by surgeons first to rule out appendicitis, then come to us to try to rule out an ectopic pregnancy at that time. Unless obviously the patient is hemodynamically sta unstable with a previous known ectopic or, or high risk factors for ectopic pregnancy and is having uh, increased uh, PV bleeding at that point, then obviously we would be going down to see that patient uh, first. Coming back to the appendicitis picture, uh, in terms of investigations, you would do the bloods to find out what the inflammatory markers are doing. Uh, try to arrange an ultrasound scan uh, as soon as possible, but obviously uh, this can be quite tricky to arrange uh, if you are working out of hours. So CT scan would be your best bet at that point. Uh, but always remember for a pregnant woman, uh, you should always counsel them with regards to risk of uh, high radiation to the breast tissues if they are pregnant. As long as you're explaining um, all the, you're giving them all the information, explaining all the risk versus benefits and the patient has capacity and is accepting the CT, then you, you should be going for a CT scan if, if it's out of hours and you're really worried with regards to query and appendicitis at that point. But I'll leave that to the surgical team to make that kind of decision really. Now, in terms of management, so for appendicitis, antibiotics uh, are not usually sufficient if it's an acute appendicitis. Um, surgery is usually indicated at that point because if we don't treat that acute appendicitis, the risk for fetal mortality and having a miscarriage uh, at any point increases to a high level up to 36% at that point. So we need to make sure to treat the appendicitis at an early stage um, rather than waiting towards the end where it can lead to a perforation and then um, a miscarriage as well, and, and even a late miscarriage. Um, so in terms of surgery, uh, they would usually proceed with either laparoscopic or open, depending on whether it's ruptured or not, and depending on the age of the patient. Um, 
but it needs an MDT decision because it depends on the gestation age of the woman as well in terms of what would be the safest uh, option for the surgery with a open a laparoscopic um, because uh, her being pregnant at that stage changes uh, a lot of things with regards to risk to pregnancy. So this would need an MDT discussion um, with the obstetrics team and um, the general surgical team. Now, a third presentation, which I actually had uh, last week, um, someone presented to a &E, uh, being 32 weeks pregnant at that stage uh, with right upper quadrant pain, uh, was seen by um, general surgeons. Um, they first uh, referred to us because obviously she's 32 weeks pregnant and they would want her to be seen by the obstetrics team straight away. Uh, but it turned out to be um, acute cholecystitis after they've done a CT scan on that woman and with her raised, with her deranged inflammatory markers. So generally speaking, um, with the uh, increase in uh, estrogen and progesterone happening in pregnancy, this predisposes any woman to increase risk of having gallstones. Um, and a lot of women would be symptomatic with these gallstones when they are pregnant. So basically with a, with a rise in estrogen and progesterone, um, it leads to a lot of stagnation with bile um, in the common bile duct uh, and increase in cholesterol secretion, which again um, makes you at a higher risk of developing gallstones. And there's a reduced, that these rise of the two hormones of oestrogen and progesterone reduced the smooth muscle motility um, for the gallbladder and the common bile duct as well. Again, making that woman at a high risk of developing gallstones in pregnancy. Right, so now in terms of investigation for acute cholecystitis, we would do the bloods, uh, checking the FPC, inflammatory markers, CRP, and also the LFTs, which is more important. Um, but often, as you progress in pregnancy, the placenta would give rise to a deranged ALP anyway. So any deranged ALPs can be quite normal in pregnancy because it tends to rise to two to four times its normal value to a max of 400 uh, international units uh, at that point. So it may not be very reliable in determining an obstructive picture um, for the bile duct. So that's why a lot of surgeons would rather and do an ultrasound scan as soon as possible if during working hours or otherwise a CT scan if out of hours over the weekend when an ultrasound scan is not available. Now in terms of management for um, the acute cholecystitis or cholelithiasis would be, well, for acute cholecystitis would be, um, generally speaking, admission for antibiotics um, to make sure that they are recovering quite well and how it would this would be determined would be by doing daily um, bloods on that woman to make sure that she is doing better. Um, so surgery can be indicated if this cholecystitis um develops into cholangitis further down the road um, uh, or the woman is really unwell uh, with the cholecystitis developing into sepsis afterwards. But again, uh, as always, it needs to be um, after a discussion with the MDT team involving, evol involving us uh, as the obstetrics team at that point. And it would, it would, the surgery would usually be done as a laparoscopic intervention um, rather than an open intervention anyway. Um, so any questions so far with regards to what I've um, just talked about? You can feel free to type anything in the chat box that I can have a look and answer any of your questions uh, as we go along. Right, so the next one will be I'll be talking about pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, so PID, usually an upper genital tract infection occurring in the woman, which can be in the form of endometritis, salpingitis, inflammation of the tubes, basically, uh, ophritis, inflammation um, of the ovaries, or development of a tubal ovarian abscess. Um, in the UK, it's, I mean, the prevalence is generally 
quite high. It's 1.7% uh, of the general population and it's getting higher and higher as the years are progressing because there's been a recent rise in uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia not sensitive to many of the antibiotics, um, particularly in the Northwest uh, for some odd reason. Um, they've been quite resistant to many of the antibiotics. So it's very, it's PID is a very common um, GP, GP present, um, it's a very common presentation coming to GP land um, for women aged under 45 years. And they always um, would send them to the gyne, to gyne assessment unit for a quick checkup, double swabs and initial treatment at that time. So as I was mentioning, um, the most in, the most important risk factors uh, is a previous history of pelvic inflammatory disease or any previous chlamydia or gonorrhea infection in the past. Um, most of the PIDs in the UK are caused by chlamydial infection uh, and then followed by gonorrheal infection. Another risk factor is Another risk factors is vaginal douching, where some people will um, tend to do vaginal douching two or three times a day with um, squirting some vaginal, uh, li some vinegar liquids and other uh, antiseptic uh, sort of soaps um, inside the vagina at that point, which is not recommended. So. Another, another risk factor would be smoking and coming from a low socioeconomic group. And another one would be recent in, insertion of an IUCD, usually over the first four weeks of insertion of either Myrina coil or a copper coil. Um, and also any recent gynae procedures, be it surgical evacuation of a miscarriage, embryo transfer, um, or hysterosalpinogram. Um, at that point. So how do they usually present? Um, it, they would usually come in with vague symptoms of lower or generalized abdominal pain, usually with uh, vaginal discharge, which can be um, quite purulent um, or sometimes quite thin as well, depending on the stage uh, of the pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, if it's been there for quite a while, they can also can also lead to systematic um, symptom signs as well, with them having fever, malaise, and loss of appetite. So, in terms of examination finding, um, you would want to do a speculum examination to see how the cervix is looking, how the cervical mucus and vaginal mucus are, are looking. Uh, a lot of the time, you would see some mucopurulent discharge. Um, from the cervix, inflamed cervix and vaginal walls, um, and sometimes some bleeding. Um, so you would want to take double swabs, be it the high vaginal swab and the endocervical swab uh, at that point. And you would want to do a vaginal examination to try to, el for two things really. One is to try to elicit the cervical motion tenderness. How you would do that? Uh, is just by gently flicking um, the ectocervix region and close to the um, cervical loss. Uh, and you should see, uh, well, unfortunately, a big reaction from the woman. The woman would be in severe pain at that point, and you would know that this is the actual cervical motion tenderness that you are eliciting at that stage. Um, you should also try to palpate the adnexa for any palpable masses, which can be a sign of any tubal ovarian abscess at that point. Uh, investigations, you would want to do, um, as I've mentioned, the swab, double swabs, taking some bloods to make sure that inflammatory markers are not too raised. So this can tailor, tailor your management plan in terms of whether it would be as an outpatient versus as an inpatient. Um, ideally, you would want to have a transvaginal ultrasound scan to make sure to know if there's any tubal ovarian abscess and more so to know the size of the tubal ovarian abscess and whether it's a hydrosalpinx or a pyosalpinx as well altogether to get a baseline of the size as well. So in terms of the treatment, as I was mentioning, 
you can either go for an outpatient management plan or an inpatient management plan this will again be based on a few things how stable the woman is is at present all the observations of the woman the bloods of the woman uh, with regards to inflammatory markers and also the size of the tubal ovarian abscess generally speaking when we talk about tubal ovarian abscess there's no uh, hard rule about the tubal ovarian abscess but a lot of places it, it's based on surgeons preference but a lot of surgeons i f i find if the tubal ovarian abscess is anything less than five centimeters then it can be managed um with just um antibiotics on its own and can most of the time be managed as as an outpatient uh, regime if it's quite small usually less than three centimeters on average and the patient is really well in herself so in terms of the outpatient management plan, you would usually give an IM dose of ketriaxone followed by oral doxycycline and metronidazole for 14 days. Um, and most of the time, if it's um, an STI caused, if the, it, if the cause of the PID is an STI, you would want a test of Q as well further down the road. Um, now, in terms of inpatient re regimes, it would be IV ketriaxone followed by um, IV doxycycline, then depending on the improvement of the bloods and the observations of the woman, you can um, step it down to oral antibiotics again to doxycycline and metronidazole for a total of 14 days um, of antibiotics for her to go home. But if they are with a tubal ovarian abscess, um, a lot of the time you would want them to have a follow-up ultrasound scan in maybe four to six weeks time to make sure that the size of the tubal ovarian abscess is uh, regressing um, um quick question to you guys so if someone presents to to you with a suspected pelvic inflammatory disease as that your main um working diagnosis and she has um uh, a myrena coil inside you over the last two years um what would you guys be doing in terms of the management plan for that particular lady Anyone? Yeah. So I've got someone saying um, to not remove the intrauterine um, device at that time and start the antibiotics. Um, correct. So you would usually leave the um, IUCD uh, inside you at that time, start the IV uh, or oral antibiotics, see the clinical picture, how it's improving. Um, so when when would you guys think of maybe taking the uh, Myrena coil out? Okay, so basically, you would want to to see how how the um, so how the how the lady is improving over the next forty eight to seventy two hours. If there is no clinical improvement on bloods and observation, or she still keeps on spiking temperatures after um, forty eight to um, so for the 72 hours, you would want to take the coil out at that time because obviously it's not responding well uh, to treatment and that's when you would want to take the myrena coil out because there might be a chance uh, of the infection being caused by something, one of the bacteria called uh, actinomyces uh, israeli um, and then you would want to send the coil for culture. So 
but you need to counsel the woman properly in terms of prior to you um, removing that myrina coil. So make sure that you properly counsel her with regards to her not having had unprotected intercourse over the last week really because she's at risk of falling pregnant if you take the coil out and if she still insists uh, on the fact of taking the coil out then you would need to counsel her with regards to emergency contraception uh, as well if she would want to consider it and as as i was mentioning so if you take the coil out send it for um culture uh, at that point uh, and also specifically and um, also specifying with regards to if they can specifically test for actinomyces uh, like organisms on on that coil so the next slide i'll be talking about adnexal torsion so uh, ovarian um, and uh, tube torsion so about 50 percent um of the ovarian torsion will be quite palpable because ovarian torsion is likely to happen for uh, an ovarian cyst which is usually you i'm saying usually more than five centimeters uh, in size because anything less than five centimeters has a lower risk of uh, torting and um, the one cyst that is at the high risk of torting when it's more than five centimeters are usually dermoid cyst at that point so and weirdly enough once it, a cyst torsion has occurred it's mostly um the arterial supply which is um compromised uh sorry um the it, which is it's so it's mostly the venous supply which is compromised but the arterial supply is usually maintained at that point um and the risk of having further torsions if someone has had one in the past is around 10 percent um so they usually come in with um, sudden o- onset of moderate to severe pain, nausea and vomiting. Uh, sometimes if the torsion has occurred quite a long time ago, they can also have high temperature as well altogether. In terms of investigations, you would want to do blood tests uh, on that woman. So doing the bloods, will you would tend to focus more on the white cell count and CRP. But again, it can be quite confusing someone co- coming in with right iliac fossa pain because it can be a few things happening. Um, I mean, if she's, wh- whether she's pregnant or non-pregnant, if she's pregnant, the differential would be um, appendicitis, uh, ovarian torsion, uh, or ectopic uh, pregnancy at that time. So torsion is more of a clinical diagnosis at that point to try to differentiate between appendicitis because if you think about it if you're looking at the white cell count and the crp both would be raised in appendicitis uh, and torsion most of the time um, ideally you would want to have a transvaginal ultrasound scan but again this is not very specific in the transvaginal ultrasound scan because you would want to look at whether she's got an enlarged uh, cyst over there you would want to apply the doppler flow to see um the arterial supply and and the venous flow as well altogether if there's any compromised in any of them and any signs of free fluids um and if obviously out of hours again uh, you can also request a ct scan to try to make sure that this is it an ovarian torsion happening uh, but again ct scan is not very specific um and sensitive at that stage so it's mostly a clinical diagnosis based on previous uh, uh, ultrasound scanning gynecological history uh, altogether um, management of the torsion so in terms of preventing that ovary and that tube um to undergo complete necrosis you should be aiming for a laparoscopic intervention obviously depending on the size of the cyst um and so a, a lot of the time a lot of the consultants would uh, rather go for a cystectomy and salping salping or ophrectomy um on that point but a lot of the new cases with torsion a lot of evidence have been showing that you should usually go for um, a detorsion at that point um, rather than a cystectomy uh, or an oophorectomy, even if it's um, engorged.
and also all of this will depend on the size of the cyst altogether how much can be salvaged um, uh, with regards to preserving ovarian function now yeah any questions guys so far with regards to what i've just been explaining through these slides before we go into um, miscarriage um, and labor yeah so ellie is asking so basically is there any non-surgical management option yeah with regards to sorry um i went straight into the surgical management so with regards to if you're really suspecting is a torsion happening at that time and the patient is unwell then you should be doing um um laparoscopic intervention in regards to it being a surgical intervention because if you're not really suspecting a torsion uh, then you can manage these patients conservatively as i was mentioning anything less than five centimeters and you're not having and you're not really suspecting a torsion and the patient is quite well in herself able to stand up walk non-deranged inflammatory markers then yes you can manage it conservatively uh, asking her to go home and um, and then to reattend if there's any complications you can also have a follow-up ultrasound scan in three um three months usually to make sure that this cyst has not increased in size altogether uh, but if you're already thinking of admitting someone with that kind with that much of discomfort uh, and you're suspecting a torsion happening time is of a limiting factor unfortunately at that point so it needs to be a big discussion between you and the consultant um, or senior registrar in terms of whether you should be going for a diagnostic exploration sometimes not necessarily um, needing a cystectomy uh, and oophorectomy or not even a detorsion but just an exploration to make sure that no necrosis has happened and this most of the time would usually occur uh, during the weekend or out of hours where you've got limited um, access to scans um, mostly. So now with regards to, so the next topic will be miscarriage. So in the, mis in the UK, miscarriage is defined as the loss of an intrauterine pregnancy less than 24 weeks. This can be further subdivided into whether you're having it in the first trimester uh, for it to be an early miscarriage or in the second trimester for it to be defined as a late miscarriage. A lot of the time women will ask you um, a bit confused about why they're having a miscarriage. But 50% of the time is mostly because of chromosomal anomalies uh, happening. And this is basically the, the uterus detecting those uh, chromosomal abnormalities and then stopping pregnancy uh, on its own. So essentially, unfortunately, survival of the fittest, uh, which is happening at that time. If there's no other risk factors like uh, smoking, increased maternal age as well altogether. So... There the are different types of miscarriage depending on this the cervical loss, whether it's opened or closed. And if you can see any tissues of pregnancy, if all the tissues of pregnancy have been passed or some of them or none at all. Um, as you can see on this slide, where first one is the threatened miscarriage, uh, where the cervical loss is closed and there's no tissues that you can see and nothing has been passed inevitable miscarriage should be one where the cervical os is open uh, this can be quite tricky to diagnose sometimes particularly in women who's had a few normal deliveries in the past where if you've not been examining many if you've not been doing many speculums in the past you can easily mistake a multi uh, a multi gravid gravidus um cervical os for an os being open so yeah so inevitable miscarriage is cervical os being open but there's no passage of um tissues of pregnancy at present so far but again higher chance of it 
to develop into a complete or incomplete miscarriage further down the road. And you need to explain to them um, that it's an inevitable miscarriage. And unfortunately, um, the chances of miscarriage happening over the next 24 to 48 hours is quite high at that stage. Incomplete miscarriage now is when the cervical, the cervical loss is open. Uh, some, some of the tissues of pregnancy has been um, passed where a lot of women will take pictures of the tissues of pregnancy and show that to you so you can confirm that these are actually um, tissues of pregnancies and not uh, only blood clots that they've been passing. Um, third one would be a complete miscarriage where the cervical os is now closed because all the tissues of pregnancies have been passed um, so far. Um, if you're so coming to the next slide, so the presentation would be they're coming to usually gynae assessment unit with abdominal pain and PV bleeding. You would do a speculum examination again to try to determine to classify it as uh, whether it's a threatened, uh, in, inevitable, incom incomplete or complete miscarriage. Uh, ideally, you would want to do an ultrasound uh, scan as soon as possible. Again, if if it's a case of uh, threatened miscarriage, you would want to do that ultrasound scan uh, mainly to assess viability uh, of the fetus. Uh, there are a few markers on the on the on the ultrasound scan that that you would want to have a look at. Usually, if someone is technically more than five weeks, ideally more than six weeks, they should have a fetal heart on the ultrasound scan. So, if they don't have a fetal heart when the gestation age is more than six or seven weeks, um, there may be a possibility of miscarriage happening, but that is not definitive. So, you need to see something called the crown rump length usually so the threshold is seven millimeters for the crown uh, rump length which is documented on the ultrasound scan so if, some, if someone hands you an ultrasound scan report and you see it, that they have been documenting that the crown crown rump length basically a crl is less than seven millimeters and you're not seeing a fetal heart activity that's perfectly fine it just means that it's way too early in pregnancy for fetal heart to be present but any crl more than seven millimeters you should be seeing a fetal heart so you can say if you've got a crl more than seven millimeters uh, on an ultrasound scan report but no fetal heart it's a miscarriage that has happened unfortunately now they can also document about something called mean gestational sac diameter so the cutoff mark is 25 millimeters at that point so anything more than 25 millimeters, you should be seeing a York sac and ideally fetal pole at that point uh, and the CRL as well altogether. So anything more than 25 millimeters and you're not seeing a York sac, fetal pole or CRL, you can be thinking of it being unembryonic in nature. And obviously you won't see a fetal heart, so you can um, start you can start thinking that a miscarriage uh, it has happened for that lady. Uh, so many times when you have a discussion with those ladies with regards to a miscarriage um, happening uh, at that point, um, and they, they are not entirely sure, mostly, for example, the CRL is just seven millimeters or the main gestational sac is just 25 millimeters. So basically both on the exact cutoff point. What you can do is repeat the ultrasound scan in a week's time to make sure that um, there's nothing has changed. Because if you repeat the, the ultrasound scan in a week's time, usually the CRL should increase by at least a good two millimeters, as well as the gestational sac should increase by at least three, three to f well three millimeters on average. And if at that time you don't see uh, a fetal heart activity, then you can safely diagnose uh, a miscarriage at that point. Um, in terms of management of um, miscarriage, there are three main management plans for miscarriage. One, the first one being expectant, second is medical, third is surgical. So in terms of how, in terms of when would you counsel for these different forms of management for miscarriage, it depends on a few things really. So for example, it depends on how hemodynamically stable the patient is at that time. If the patient is having heavy PV bleeding, um, so you should be thinking of going more for a surgical um, 
management plan because uh, this patient can be compensating for now because she's quite young. But then if she carries on having heavy PV bleeding at that point, she can uh, start decompensating uh, after having bled a liter or two. So she'd be thinking of going for a surgical evac straight away. Um, now, if if nothing of this is happening with regards to um, hemodynamic, hemodynamic stability and observations are perfectly fine and there's no heavy bleeding from down below, now you would need to base, your, to base it on uh, the ultrasound scan findings, basically. So in terms of the size um, of um, the products of conception, basically, Generally speaking, there are two cutoff marks. One is being 25 millimeters. The second one is being 50 millimeters. Anything less than 25 millimeters, you can safely advise the woman um, for expectant management um, of the miscarriage if she's willing to, to go for it. Um, now, anything in between 25 to 50, you can offer uh, medical or surgical management uh, with medical being um, giving the woman misoprostol um, can be one course of misoprostol then 48 hours a second course of misoprostol depending on how she's reacting to it now for i've put in terms of where the products of conception are for example if the product of conception is at the fundus uh, it may be quite difficult to to go for the expectant or medical management um, because it can be quite stuck at the fundus, then you would probably be needing to consider surgical management um, of miscarriage at that stage. Um, so coming back to the different cutoff points, so 25 and 50, if anything is more than 50 millimeters in size, um, ideally you would want to go for a surgical uh, management of the miscarriage. It, this can be either in the form of manual vacuum aspiration or surgical uh, evacuation. Now, it also depends on the gestation age. You can you can always go for this the expectant and the surgical management uh, safely up to thirteen weeks uh, of gestation at that time. But anything more than this, you would need to consider more of the medical management, where you would be depending on the pathway. You can be giving mifepristone. Uh, first and then 24 to 48 hours after giving misoprostol. Okay, uh, but all of these needs to be after a good discussion with the woman and taking the woman's preference uh, into consideration um, and explaining all the risk and benefits of these different forms of management. Uh, any questions so far, guys? Nope. Okay. Now, um, the, th the third thing, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is um, someone coming um, to a &E with um, query labor at that time. So labor is characterized by the onset of regular Con regular and frequent contractions associated with any cervical changes, uh, i.e. dilation of the cervix or shortening of the cervix as well altogether and progressive descent of the presenting part. So labor less someone going into labor less than 37 weeks is termed as preterm delivery uh, preterm labor. Anything more than 37 plus zero onwards is term labor at that time. They usually wouldn't present to A and E uh, at that stage. They usually come straight to maternity triage where we would usually put them on continuous fetal monitoring, uh, i.e. the CTG, and someone will palpate for the uh, abdominal contractions, uh, and it will also be picked up on um, the TOCO for the CTG at that point. Uh, it's very important to diagnose preterm 
labor because it has different implications in terms of whether uh, you would want to start a few things depending on the gestation age which is whether you would want to give steroids for long maturations uh, maturation of the baby give magnesium sulfate to allow for proper neuro uh, development uh, for the baby uh, and so that's why it's very important to to make sure to diagnose preterm labor the, um, the investigations you would want to do is uh, do speculum examination to see the cervix, uh, whether you can see the cervix being closed or open, whether it's long or short. Uh, if it sometimes can be quite tricky to determine whether the cervix is open or closed or long as well altogether. Uh, for example, if someone has had five five normal deliveries in the past and the vaginal walls are literally collapsing whilst you're doing the speculum examination so you can possibly possibly at that time do a gentle vaginal examination to determine whether uh, the cervical loss is open you shouldn't technically do any vaginal examination because you can stimulate uh, inadvertently uh, labor by giving an inadvertent sweep but if you can't see that cervix and you need to make uh, a diagnosis in terms of then to whether start a few management plan then you're left with not much option none to do a gentle um, vaginal examination now um, there's a test called fetal fibronectin depends on whether it's available uh, in your center or not so it's a small swab um, basically where you do it um, at the for posterior fornix ideally uh, take the swabs and it can be done any time from 24 plus 0 to 33 plus 6 really at that time and it would give you a value for to calculate for whether that woman is going into lay preterm labor or not so different values based on different centers um are usually used but you can also enter the value of the fetal fibronectin on an app called Quip app, Q U I W P, which will where they will ask you a few questions with regards to the risk of that woman going into preterm labor. You can fill in um, those boxes, and it will give you a percentage of delivery within the next week. Usually, if that value is less than five percent, then it's it's reassuring in nature. Uh, but again, you have to take it. Uh, with a pinch of salt because things are very dynamic in nature and these can progress essentially doing the fibronectin and entering the quip uh, value will help to let to make you make the decision of whether uh, to start tocolizing to prevent that cervix to dilate any further with uh, giving nifedipine or atosiban depending on where you're working um, uh, this tocolizing will help to to halt uh, to hold labor basically for a period of time that you can administer steroids and start magnesium sulfate at that point okay so now the last part of the slide which i'm not going to talk much about is um someone coming to a and e with uh, it sometimes can be quite hard to distinguish between labor and abruption uh, happening all together so you should be really thinking of um, placental abruption or uterine rupture if if obviously they've had a previous cesarean section if the pain that the woman is having is continuous in nature not giving her much respite uh, in between because labor in itself will be more of contractions and then period of uh, having no contractions and again contractions again so it's quite intermittent in nature now for the abruption um it's generally uh, tender all over the abdomen and it would be of a woody feel to the abdomen but this is when it's quite a significant abruption happening that would be quite woody in nature a uh, woody feel in nature so these women need to be transferred to um, maternity unit as soon as possible because it need continuous uh, ctg to for fetal well-being and also depending because they a lot of the time these abruptions can present with no PV bleeding at all um, and then because it's only when it's quite significant then it can be um, then it would be when the abruption is quite far down the road then you would have uh, PV bleeding because otherwise it can be quite concealed in nature um, so yeah 
what I would say is if you're suspecting abruption or uterine rupture, then you should be ideally sending them to maternity uh, unit as soon as possible or um, or asking the registrar to come down to see that, that patient as soon as possible. Uh, risk factors for abruption would be previous abruption. Uh, smoking is a very big risk factor. Any trauma to the abdomen and also preeclampsia. Um, uh, I also wanted to talk about ectopic, but that would be a long topic for me to um, have a discussion about. Um, but I think this has already been covered by one of my colleague, Helen, in the past, or will possibly be covered in the future. Um, so, yeah, that's that's it really from me. Um, So yeah, any questions from you guys? I'm sorry, this was quite an informative session, really, where I've talked, I think, way too much. And it must have been quite overwhelming to you guys, um, having that massive influx of information. But hopefully you can go through the slides again um, if you need any clarification um, at some point. And all those statistics and percentages and management plans have been based on the Royal College of Obsengani, based on their um, latest papers and e-learnings and everything altogether. All righty. I believe we've not got any more questions. Um, if there, right. Thank you very much, Dr. Kadaru, and hope everyone have a good week ahead. Thank you. No problem at all. Have a nice week ahead, guys.